Welcome to Operation Self Reset. I am Jake Naraki, and now it's time to press your reset. What is going on, Reset Nation? Welcome back to another great episode. Thank you very much, first off, to my main man, Chris Datson, D-A-T-S-O-N. He provided the intro music. What do you guys think? I would love to get your feedback. I personally love it. I think it's engaging, it's powerful, and it gets you moving in the right direction. It gets you jiving, and it feels good. You know, it feels like a good wave of energy passing through you because that's what I feel is lacking in this world is is good old-fashioned excitement energy. You know, imagine yourself on the edge of an airplane looking down and going, oh my gosh, I'm strapped to this dude behind me and we're going to be free falling for about four minutes before the parachute opens. That's that's exhilarating. There is no cup of coffee, no cup of tea, no shot of heroin out there. Well, I don't know, maybe heroin. I don't, I don't know. I never tried any of those crazy drugs, but to give you that type of rush. And, and so for me personally, that rush that I get is through music. And I'm not a big music junkie, but I know what I like. And I think each and every one of us has a song out there that really just hits us to the core, that really connects with us. And Chris, I believe, has really brought it um, for for the great intro to this podcast. Because, you know, like I said, this this is all about resetting you, your own personal change, your personal journey, improving yourself, challenging yourself, and wanting to max out your life. A, a fan just sent me back an email and he said, Jake, I love when you said, you know, drive it like you stole it. And I forget your name. I'm sorry, buddy. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll probably put in the show notes um, that, you know what, you, you're, you're right. Drive it like you stole it. This is the only life we have. Let's max it out. Let's have some fun. Let's get crazy. Let's learn some great things. Let's improve ourselves. Let's get daring and challenging. And let's fail a lot. And let's fail often. And let's keep on moving one foot in front of the next. So, uh, Chris, my man, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate it. And if you guys want to give me back some feedback, if you really like it, if you really hate it, whatever, send me send me an email, jake at operationselfreset.com. Before we jump into the interview today with Martin Stellar. Uh, he is a monk and he talks about selling. And the reason why I brought him on is number one, he's a monk. So he's very clear on meditation and, and being thoughtful. But the second is, <laughs> well, I didn't really bring him on because he's a monk. I, I just thought his qualities of life were very interesting. And second of all, selling. I think every, well, I believe each and every one of us is truly a seller inside. We, we, we need to be selling every single day. It's our beliefs. I'm doing it on this podcast. Uh, you know, you're doing it in your day job. You're doing it with your kids. You're selling your kids on, on brushing their teeth, eating healthy, trying to read before bed, all that stuff. Why not get really, really good at it? And not in a scammy, I'm going to trick you kind of way, in a full out, open, genuine, clear, conscious, feel good about it, but just really hit home those key points to you personally. That's what I believe a good salesman is. So, um, you know, Martin's are really going to bring the house on that. Uh, and, and, you know, right before we slide into that, I want to talk about normal. There's a lot of people out there that speak of a normal life. Well, I just want to be normal. I just want to have the normal cycle of life as in, you know, you, you're a child, you have fun, you start thinking about your job, you go into high school, you know, you you play sports and activities, you meet some core people in your life, from there you go to college or you go into the working world and you get a J-O-B, you work at it really hard, you try to provide for that company, they give you a base salary, throughout the years you increase your salary, you get married, you have a dog, you have kids, and you go on a couple of family vacations, you save enough money, you try to support the family, you know, doing different things, helping the children with their endeavors and college and all that stuff and just pay it forward. And that is truly a normal life, right? And the reason why I bring this up is because for me personally, I don't speak a lot about this and I'm going to be trying to open up a little bit more with the fire department. I work in a very unique job. Um, I'm never going to overlay uh, the fire service over this podcast, but I just want to incorporate a couple of things. For me personally, I work a 24-hour shift. At 8 a.m. in the morning, I go to work, where I actually leave the house around 7. I get there at 7.30, my work shift starts at 8 a.m. and I return home 
or our shift ends at the next day, 8 a.m. We eat lunch and dinner at the firehouse. We sleep at the firehouse. We can't leave the firehouse unless there's a call for EMS, emergency medical call, or a fire, car accidents, all different types of stuff. Um, and the stuff I see is really crazy. I work for in Milwaukee, um, which is the nation's 21st largest city, I believe. Our fire department is within like, you know, mid teens of busyness. So we're a very active fire department over a thousand members and um, you know I see some pretty crazy stuff and my wife and I talk about this all the time we talk about normal my wife is like well we don't have a normal life Jake you know you're always gone I'm here with the kids by myself you know normal is is the people that come home and and they're able to spend time with their family and they all go to bed together they all wake up together they all get the kids going together all that stuff and I said well that's not our life we are not normal and it, it kind of like like clicked in my brain a little bit that truly we all of us need to stop thinking like we're normal. Like there's no reason why we need to limit ourselves with the normal thinking. So my plan for the next, however long this podcast keeps on running, is to transform our definition of normal. Normal isn't about just going through the motions. Normal, the new normal, the redefined normal, is about taking time out of your day and focusing on yourself, focusing on your goals, really pressing forward with your goals, staying up a little bit later after everybody else when they go to bed so you can you work on those projects you can think creatively, you can meditate, you can journal, you can focus on the next bigger idea than what you're currently doing. Each of us has a purpose in this life. I don't know what your purpose is. I'm not saying that you need to go out there and read, buy books and find your passion and purpose, but truly, really, really just think for a second, like you are here for some reason. Either you're, think of a chessboard, and I think of it like this. There's, of course, the the pawns on the front, and those are the people that just go through life. You know, they they do their job, they do it well, they have some exciting times, but they're just kind of pawns in the game. And then you got the back row of the chess pieces, which are the, the meat of the game. You know, you got the castles, the horses, the bishops, the king, the queen, and those are the powerhouses that can slide across the board and make things happen. You listening to this right now, you are on that back line. You are the castles, the horses, the bishops, the king or the queen, whatever it is, start visualizing yourself as that person in the game of life. There's nobody that should be listening to this podcast right now that'd be thinking, well, I feel like I'm a pawn. No, you're not because you know what you're doing right now? You are taking a time out of your day to listen to this podcast. And I'm not saying this podcast is going to have every answer and it's going to blow you away and all that stuff, but it shows that you're dedicating time towards yourself. And that is the most important thing that you can do out there besides reading books and, and really discovering your true being and all that fun stuff. But there's a lot of people that the pawns choose not to read, listen, to challenge themselves. By you even even listening to this the first time, that's fine. If it's your first time, I don't care. You are on that back row because you're trying to search for something a little bit different. Not too many people go into work and be like, hey man, you know, Jake, how you been? Good, good. Just listen to another great podcast of Operation Self Reset, trying to change myself. And they'll be like, what the heck are you trying to do? You, you don't say that to other people because you know why? Because those people that you hang out with are probably normal. Those are probably the people that work good at, you know, work hard at their job. They make decent money. They go on decent trips and they live a normal life. But you feel like there's something more, like there's, like there's something else that you're missing or there's something you're trying to discover about yourself or change or transform or, or you know, lose that weight so you feel more confident. Whatever it is, you're trying to do something a little bit different than those pawns in the game of life. So that is why I'm really on this quest now to start challenging the definition of normal. Let's elevate that definition. Let's make normal our normal, you know, of taking time out of our day and focusing on ourselves, of what we really want, identifying what is our purpose, what are we really here for, and um, you know, it's it's really deep. And I'm and I, I'm sorry if I'm starting to lose you guys. Um, you know, I, of course, my values are still exactly the same, and and my mindset of where I want to go personally, but it's just a really different approach, and I'm excited to um, continue to share this with you. So, uh, with that being said, uh, <laughs> hopefully that wasn't too deep and too over the top but it was uh i felt that the chess board was really good because i'm a big chess player i enjoy chess it's a challenging game and uh life as we all know is very very challenging so uh let's dive into the interview with martin my man my man martin uh great guy a uh, soft spoken but really powerful with some of his tips i hope you enjoy i appreciate all you guys so much we'll catch you on the back side of the interview 
Hey guys, welcome back. Today we have on Martin Steller, and he is a writer, a marketer, and an ex-monk of 12 years. Martin came back into the real world after dropping the ministry, and he started a tailor shop. He's done a couple of things in his life, but he finally ended up now helping people with copywriting and marketing for their own personal business. I'm pretty sure we're going to dive into many aspects of life, religion, and what is the meaning of us being here in the first place. So, Martin, my man, thank you so much for coming on the Operation Self Reset podcast. Very welcome. Thanks for having me on. You know what? I think the obvious place to start, a monk for 12 years. First of all, what pulled you into the ministry? Like, what excited you, or, or was it something that was always eating away at you that you're just like, I have to go... And discover oh, this. No, 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 no. I considered myself an atheist um, back in the day. Oh. Um, and I had no desire for any kind of uh, introspection uh, at all. I was more like philosophy, phil philosophically inclined, you know, thinking sure. about things. I did read when I was you know, 15, 16, um, the old book. And then there would be a Buddhist master. And that would be very... Um, mysterious, like what, what, what's that about? Sure. Um, so at some point, a number of years later, I got in touch with um, someone who said that meditation can be good for you if you want. You can try. You can come and visit. And it was a very inspiring person. Um, so I felt attracted to the experience to just see what it's like, and it was very good. Sure. So I started showing up once a week, um, and twice a week. At some point, I started staying the night in, in the house with the, uh, the other members of the community, uh, helping out in the kitchen, helping out with chores, until I was there practically every single night. Um, and I gave up my own room in, in another city, uh, moved into the area there so that I could you know, have an easier life and not be paying rent for a place where I don't stay. And over time, I slowly grew into the idea that, yeah, actually, I want to um, go full on with this. I, I want to see what's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. At that time in the community, the idea of a more monastic um, way of living with very strict vows started to grow. And I saw other people experiment with that. And I saw what it was doing to them. So it was a very natural process to grow into... Um, Kind of non-religious, sure. which is weird, because if you're talking about a monastery, then it, it, it's got to be religious in some way. But right. that philosophy was without any sort of dogma. It was very much experience-based. Like if, if you sit down and you do that mantra, then you see results over time. And if you adopt these attitudes, that will bring you different results. Uh, if you experiment with these vows, like on a kind of casual basis, then you will see how difficult that can be. And that will also bring you results. And after a number of years of that, um, I spent six years going around with that, living in the community. And at some point, I felt ready to take the vows. And that's when I became uh, a proper monk. Oh, I see. And how old were you at the time? At that time, I think I was 26 or 27. Okay. And would you say before that, were you kind of in... Obviously, you slowly went into it. You know, you said you went a couple of times and then, you know, every day of the week. And then next thing you know, you're kind of staying over. And I would assume that this was over a year or so, um, you know, for yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so obviously, you know, you, you grew cups custom. You liked what they were doing, all that stuff. What were you doing before that? Were you kind of, kind of just <laughs> floating, or, you know, around, bouncing from job to job, you know, talking yeah. to different people and, and yeah. Okay. Breaking things. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it was actually my mother who turned me on to to this gentleman. She okay. uh, he, he's the man who who later ended up becoming the abbot when the monastic community got formed. Uh, she said, "Yeah, you know, we met this man, my boyfriend and I, and um, we noticed that everything that you do in life doesn't work. What you pick up breaks off. <laughs> sure. So um, maybe it would be good to go and talk to this man. He's a shaman, and uh, I don't need no shaman to help me." I, don't need no stinking help. Right, right, right. But right. the idea of a shaman, you know, I'd read about that in, in books and it was, again, it was something very, um, um, yeah, this mysterious kind of, what, what is that about? Sure, sure. So I went there and he did his, his, um, his ritual 
and I came out feeling okay. It wasn't anything uh, yeah, spectacular, right? Yeah. No, it was not like oh, suddenly I have no more problems where the whole world. Is right, there. right. But I, I did notice that I, in, in in the weeks that followed, I noticed different reactions in myself. Hmm. I could tell that what used to really get me upset instantly, uh, meh. Yeah, interesting. Didn't react didn't cause such such a um, strong reaction, and that told me that yeah, it would be good to go back there and and join these meditations, because apparently something beneficial had happened to me. Right. Well, I'll have more of that. Why not? Right, right, right. You started to get addicted to that uh, that feeling of oh, okay, you know, life seemed to be a little bit clearer, uh, a mm-hmm. little a little smoother. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you enjoy it a little bit more. And of course, I mean, it, hey, that sounds almost like taking a drug of some sort. That's why people keep on doing it, you know? And, and obviously you're doing it for the mental and the clarity. And 12 years, I mean, that's a long time to dedicate yourself to the, the, the ministry. Um, throughout that 12 years, I, I mean, I would love to keep talking about these 12 years, but we don't have enough time to, to dissect them. I guess looking back on those 12 years, I guess what are a couple of things that you pulled from the ministry that you still use today? Because um, I'm sure, you know, in, you know, being, you know, being a monk, you know, there is, you know, things that you did on a daily basis, you know, the, mm. the, uh, the years of silence, correct? Like you couldn't talk for a couple of years or all 12 years. Is that true? No, we, we had uh, periods of silence. That periods of be- silence, okay. Yeah, a couple of months straight, um, but that was then like like a spiritual exercise for that time. Okay, um, it wasn't like like twelve years without speaking. Okay, uh, Benedictine monks do that, or actually they used to. I see. Uh, they never speak. Jeez, I don't know. If I, yeah, I don't know. well, <laughs> hey. I mean, it has its, its drawbacks as well because they ended up inventing sign language for themselves, so they were having all kinds of jokes. Uh... And no talking. So, See, you know, they went around it. It's like the school mm-hmm. teacher told everybody to be quiet, put their hand in notes back and forth. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so what is what are a couple of things that you pulled away that you still mm-hmm. use in your life today? Okay. Um, mindset and attitude is huh. very important. Interesting. Okay. Uh, smiles. Uh, there's definite benefits to deciding to take things uh, in a lighthearted way and to react with a positive um uh, attitude when things don't go the way you want. Sure, it's it's a mechanism that works on your on your mind, and if you make a habit out of it, it becomes very powerful. It makes you very very resilient. Uh, rituals, habits, and rituals. So, I have a number of very very fixed uh, habits for fr- from the moment I get out of bed um, throughout my day. Everything is its place, its time. I have I can go into it if you want. Um, my house, the way I have everything organized, is everything in the same place. N- nothing that I don't use on the tables. It, it doesn't look sterile. I mean, there's definitely somebody living here. Right. But it's exactly composed in a constellation that I feel is conducive to, to my focus, concentration, and happiness. Sure. Let's talk about your morning routine real quick. Uh, I interviewed a gentleman uh, who's a big believer in waking up and having uh, a routine. And, and as myself, you know, I'm, I'm speaking right now. It's 5 a.m. In, in America and it's uh, mm-hmm. it's high noon by you and you're in Spain. Um, and I have rituals. Um, I wake up at 4.30 each morning. I go through visualization, gratitude, and then I dive into my typing and stuff like that. I mean, it's a very short <laughs> ritual, but hey, it's something to get me started. You know, um, what is it? That, hours. Yours is three hours. Wow. Yeah. My goodness. Give us give us the quick rundown. All right. Well, the first thing I do is uh, I make the bed. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Because that is just something that programs your mind. If the first thing that you do is uh, when you get up is you clean up, you know, you organize and straighten out the sheets. Um, you you sign your day in, in the token of order and uh, focus. So that's the first thing I do. Cool. Then I drink uh, some water with lemon juice and instantly sit down and meditate for 20 minutes. Mm. Next thing is uh, some breakfast, uh, coffee and fruit and a book. I, I always read. First thing that I do after meditation is uh, is me time. Cool. Because if I begin my day uh, with putting new information in my mind, then this day is going to be just a little bit better. I'm going to be a little bit smarter than I was yesterday. That's smart. And that's again, it's, it's programming your mind. Um, then I go for a walk or I do yoga. 
Um, I usually kind of tend to go for a walk because then I can have a podcast on because then again, I'm, I'm learning something. Oh yeah, nice. Um, after that, it's a, a shower and work. And then the first thing I do when I start working is I write an email to my subscribers. Cool. It's very difficult to do that and not be tempted to go and check on Twitter and, or did you know, oh, anybody send me any yes, emails. for sure. No, do not do that. It's, it's really the best thing that you can do is um, uh, as the first task in the morning is something that furthers your business. And for me, that's writing this daily email. And only then, once I've done that, that's when actual work starts. And so altogether, that takes about oh, two, two and a half, three hours. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, the one thing I can say that's reoccurring in every a successful, I don't, I don't want to mean like success is in just money, but success, a, a driven individual, a person that has goals, um, that mm-hmm. wants to make a difference, change in the world, um, is meditation, you know, and in America here, that's, I don't want to say it's foreign because there's more guided meditation, you know, uh, tapes and, you know, apps and everything like that. And it's good. It's really good. And, and actually I, I used Headspace for about a good month and it was, it was very, it was interesting to me, you know, um, first of all, I, I fell asleep a lot of times during meditation. I think it was because I was laying on the couch right when I woke up. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think that was the best way. But I guess what are a couple of, uh, you know, cliff notes for the beginner person that wants to start meditating and bring it into their life? Make space for it and make a habit out of it. So it's, it's very difficult to, um, to fit it into daily life if, if you have to fit it in. Sure. Right? If, if you want to um, get the, 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 the benefits of meditation... It's something you need to set aside time for, just like you should do that for eating and for being with your, your spouse. Um, you plan the time ahead and you plan your other uh, activities around it, just like basically relaxing time. You know, you, The healthy way to deal with sleeping is that you go to bed every night at this or that time. Right. And you get up, And around that, you plan your work, your activities, your social life. You don't do that and then oh, I've got two hours left to sleep. And some people do that. It's not recommended. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a very big misconception in, in, in the Western world that um, the things that are good for you, that relax you, that uh, enable you to be more creative and more focused later on in the day are the things that, well, you could skip them if you don't have the time. <laughs> yeah. It's you so know, true. it's like this. Zen monk, he, he goes to his master and he says, like, oh, they, they tell me I should meditate uh, 20 minutes each day, every day. Is that true? And the master, he looks at him and he says, yes, except when you have a very busy day, then you should meditate for an hour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is really how it is. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you can't expect to get into a state of uh, concentration or focus or relaxation with meditation if um, you have to squeeze it in things. Uh, so you, you plan, the, the, the best is to do it at the same time of day, each day, whether that's in the morning or during lunch or before you go to bed, uh, depends on your situation. But every single day, around the same time or at the same time, you go and sit down and do, do your meditation, whatever kind it is. Because again, that programs uh, your mind to get ready to look forward to it and to easily slip into that state um, of relaxation. Um, what's the second thing I said? Um, uh, I oh yeah, space. Sp- there you go. Space. Yes, yes. Right. You say you 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 fell asleep because you were laying on the sofa. Right. Right. That was not ideal, though. I knew that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it's not that I want to say it's wrong, but you can make things work better. Um, get more success with it this is why i have my 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 home my workspace laid out in a specific way with everything in its place because by doing that um it gets easier for me to focus if you want to meditate and come out refreshed you feel that that, find that it's much easier to achieve if you have uh, a specific place where you have a little candle, uh, a devotional picture if you want, uh, a bell, incense, whatever it is that you have. A little constellation in a corner of the house if you don't have a special room for it. I'm, I'm lucky I, I have a house large enough to have a meditation room. Sure. 
But even if you don't have that, you know, create a little niche, a little comfortable, as private as much uh, uh, as, as you can make it in your house um, area. And you go back to that place again, because your system, your mind gets programmed to already, it's like going to sleep. You get into bed and your mind automatically starts to go into sleep mode. Right. Well, the same thing is, is with meditation. If you, if you really want to make it work, be consistent with it and make a little specific place for it. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, I heard that quote before of, uh, you know, if you're over, you know, if you're super busy and you don't have time, you know, you, nobody ever has enough time. Um, you mm-hmm. need to meditate for an hour, you know, instead of 20 minutes an hour. Uh, yeah. and, and they, they say that with everybody and mm-hmm. it's, it's really true. And the, the thing is, the thing that, that gets me going is everybody that has, has, is 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 driven like I said before successful driven on a mission whatever it is mm. is doing meditation so it's okay. not like it's it's this is some random thing only a couple people do every once in a while it, it's it's really linked to peak performance in your own personal life if that means bringing up yeah. the best happiness or clarity creativity whatever it is um, yeah. I, I really think it's something that I personally. Am, am going to try to enhance come 2015 because we're still recording this in 2014. But um, mm-hmm. I, I appreciate you sharing those uh, insights and especially making room for it, not only in your life, but also having a like, special little spot, a special mm-hmm. pillow, uh, you know, incense or that smell that triggers you to go, okay, this is what, you know, during this time right now, I'm smelling this, this is how I meditate. After that, I shut it down and I move on with my life so that next time when you sit down, you smell it again, it brings you to that right state of mind. So Yes, triggers, like you triggers, said. Triggers, yes. Triggers. Yes, triggers. And on topic of that um, meditation not being anything odd or weird, you know, there's, it, it, it very easily gets considered something airy-fairy that it's, oh, you know, the, 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 uh, the 1960s hippies, mysticism movements, and there are a lot of people who, um, what you can call new age uh, sort of movement. Sure. And then in that there's yeah, a lot of people who, who do seem to have this um, spaced out. I don't want to be derogatory because everybody has their own oh, um, right. Right. Uh, attitude and, and, and values and practices. The thing with meditation is that it by itself has proven effects and benefits, regardless of what you believe in, regardless of how you dress, uh, uh, what your philosophy is. I mean, science is showing now with with all kinds of brain scans um, what the effects of meditation are. All kinds of uh, areas in the brain get enormously enlarged um, in people who, who spend consistent amounts of time in meditation. And that effect can be had by anybody, even if you don't believe in anything. Sure. Right? It's, it's, it's not something that has to do with religion. Yes. Or, um, the, some of the most successful business people that, that you know, um, you wouldn't realize it, but they are heavy into, into meditation. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, it makes sense. I mean, the, 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 the sages of all ages have known that, yeah, they were practicing things that science is now finally getting wise to. <laughs> I find true. it fascinating to, to, to read yet another, another uh, scientific research piece that says um, the benefits of, yeah, I know, uh, I've been doing it for 25 years. Right, right. right. Nothing new to me. Right. And before that, it's been around for thousands of years and they felt the benefits. So they kept on doing it, you know, and, and now, like you said, science is finally catching up and yeah. the, the studies have proven that, like you said, you know, increasing all They're that a bit stuff. Slow. What's that? They're a bit slow. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is going to piss off a lot of scientists. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Hey, I'm pretty sure not a lot of scientists are really tuning into this one. But um, re- regardless, let's change over to the things that you learn that you're still using in your life. I'm actually currently, I have a foundation, like a formula for reaching mm-hmm. uh, personal success. And and one of the, the pillars is attitude. Because mm-hmm. attitude, you know, really does shape your day, your life, your year. Um, if you're always mm-hmm. in a, a negative Nelly, people aren't going to want to hang out with you. Then you're going to be critical of yourself. Why don't people want to hang out with me? And then you're angry at them. So it's just a vicious cycle. I guess okay. what is it with attitude that, that gets you into a good state of mind? Obviously, you're meditating. You're a very relax gentlemen you you understand things that you have control of and and but what is it with attitude i guess that people are struggling with why aren't they in a better state on a daily basis hmm. 
good question. Thank you. <laughs> I think that the starting point of attitude and the cause of much of the problems that people have is responsibility and where people place it. We very quickly blame circumstances for how we feel. Uh, we blame other people, their behavior, uh, the fact that our computer breaks. You know, Man, I have all this work to do and I'm so stressed and it's such a busy, it's the worst possible day. Damn computer. Right. Of course you feel awful and of course it's a, it's a um, really nasty situation to have to deal with. But the fact that you feel that way is because you're not taking responsibility for your reactions. You don't feel that way because your computer breaks. You feel that way because you allow yourself to get into stress. The event, the other person, the circumstance, that is only something that triggers a reaction in you. And you can control that reaction. That's not easy. It's something that you practice and that gets easier over time. It's not like you can decide that today I'm not going to be stressed about things right. anymore. But if you start that practice and you start to observe how you react to things, that's the first step to transforming your attitude and being able to not be so affected by things. Yeah. Because if you look at it, we're all constantly bombarded with all kinds of distractions and um, uh, negative experiences, um, stress in traffic, uh, your boss screaming at you, uh, an argument with your wife. Some people deal with it you know, it's like water running off a window. They don't even care. They don't notice. It just happens and they smile on and go through with their, with their work and their day. And other people experience the same thing and they go ballistic. The difference is that the people who can handle it have a different way of dealing with their reactions. And they are acutely aware that the event is not the cause of the state. Your reaction is the cause of the state. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. I guess kind of you're being aware of how you react in different situations, basically. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I think being aware is obviously uh, the first step in, in basically anything, just understanding your body, aware with your diet, aware with your attitude, uh, aware mm -hmm. with the people around you, you know, noticing mm -hmm. are these are right people that I need in my life. Um, I, I think that's really uh, beautiful that's awesome. what you said. Yeah, it, it is, you know, and mm -hmm. um I, I believe that we are obviously all in control of our attitude. Our attitude shapes who we are and you know what we become. Mm -hmm. And and thank you for sharing that because a lot of people are always looking for that that book, that, that one step process, you know, how do I just become happy and, and my you know my attitude is good enough that you know I can you know make good connections so my business can thrive. Well it's more than that, obviously, you it know. And uh, and so yeah, attitude is, is like a huge huge pillar. I believe in, and obviously as do you. If you're 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 checking on it daily, and that's something too. You know, being aware is you got to just kind of keep that in check a little bit. Um, happiness, easy to say, easy to want, hard to do. Is it something that you just always look at the positive side of things? Are you always looking? Are you always being grateful for things that are in your life? Um, what what do you do to extract happiness out of the things around you? Nothing. <laughs> Come on, you gotta give me more than that. What, what is what is it? What is it? <laughs> the thing is that you, you you can't make happiness a goal. Sure. Yeah. True. Very true. Yeah. It's extraordinarily elusive. If you want to become a happy person, it's not gonna happen, buddy. Right. It happiness is a consequence. And it sneaks up on you. And there is no one recipe for what to do and how to behave and which practices uh, uh, will allow happiness to show up in your life. As other than as long as you're searching for it, you're going to be looking the other way when it's right in front of you. Yeah. Because you'll always be looking for um, um, satisfaction in things uh, in experiences, meetings with people, um, purchases, and that is going to make you happy. You know, oh, if I if I go and hang out with that guy, or if I go and see that movie, or if I can buy that car, uh, I 
be happy. And you're looking at that, whereas if you would realize that I don't need that car, actually, I feel really great, like the way I am. Then at that moment, you're, you, you can open yourself to happiness, whether it's, it's a moment or something that, that lasts into the days and weeks. But if, if you look for it, you're always looking in the wrong place. So how do I extract? Well, I, I just go about my day. Sure. I try to be mindful of my attitude and reactions. I try to smile at people as much as I can, at myself when I can. Um, try to do the right thing, try to do, do right by people, treat myself well, uh, improve my, my mind and my, my, my body every day. And bit by bit, I have become a little bit happier. Sure. Yeah, no huge things that you incorporated. It's just the little things that you do daily to, oh, to see those so things. Much. Yeah. You know, it's 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 all the little the little efforts and the consistency in the daily practice. Um, uh, James Altucher actually has some really good podcasts about daily practice. He, uh, he does a podcast with his wife. Um, yeah, I'm a and, fan of Dave. Yeah, very good. Yeah, he's he's a highly intelligent man. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> Big inspiration. And it's, yeah, they call it the, the daily practice. And that is what it is. If, if you want to reach something in your life, uh, whether it's, it's happiness or success in business or uh, a better relationship, it is something that you work on every day. You can't just say, now I'm going to spend a year meditating and then I'm going to be a better person or a happier person. No, you, you, you make it a habit of adding a little bit of positive, good, constructive, whatever it is into the vessel called you on a daily basis. And over time that adds up until the thing bursts and you go, I'm such an idiot. I've been so happy for the last half year and I didn't even realize it. Yeah. And that's when, when you realize how everything has um, uh, accumulated and the, 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 the power that's behind uh, consistency. That's another thing you, you asked, what are the things that I took away from being in the monastery? Consistency, being very consistent hmm. is, is important. Sure. You can't resolve to be, um, you know, to be good to yourself and, and, and friendly to, to the people in your uh, direct surrounding, but you're a jerk at work. Right. N no, that is just not going to work. Right. Because your, your subconscious will, will rebel. It's not going to accept that. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny how you're saying, uh, you know, what you kind of focus on, you know, it, we always want what we can't have. We want the new car. So we're always focused mm -hmm. on that new car. But along the way, we're going to birthday parties. We're hanging out mm -hmm. with friends. We're enjoying a campfire. And that's happiness. But instead of you being there and being present, you're focused on, I want that car. Mm -hmm. How am I going to buy that car? Should I yeah. trade in my car? Should I just sell it to a friend? Should I, you know, all that stuff that gets in the way. And once you get that car, you realize, oh, the car's nice, it's cool. That fades instantly, and then you're off mm -hmm. to the next thing. Or yeah. then you go, man, I totally missed out on that cool campfire or that camping trip because I was so in tune with myself or buying that thing on eBay and trying to get the high or the lowest bid, you know, for that mm -hmm. item or whatever. You know, you need to be mm -hmm. present in life and in your activities to, to extract that happiness that's around you all the time because it's there, you know. So um, speaking of happy, were you happy mm -hmm. When you left the monastery uh, for after 12 years and then going into the tailoring business uh, as your first adventure outside of the gates. <laughs> yeah, I was, well, it was my second adventure. Uh, oh, it was, okay. Strictly speaking, um, my first venture, but second adventure. Yeah, I was, I was happy. It was a natural process. The, um, the situation in, in the monastery changed, so we had to uh, get more active to be self-sustainable. And that meant that a couple of us had to go out and look for a job, which wasn't something I was in the mood for uh, at all, because I very much liked the uh, very retreated lifestyle that we had. Sure. But I was also living with a vow of obedience. So if they say, can you go uh, find a job? That's what I went and did. Sure. Um, I ended up working in an outdoor sports company. Wow. <laughs> It's quite the... It was a change. Yeah, for sure. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah, nice. When I, when I wasn't uh, repairing the cars there, uh, I'd be driving <laughs> tourists to, um, to a lake up in the mountains with uh, kayaks in a trailer behind me. Oh, wow. 
and I'd stick them in the in the in the kayak. They'd go down, and in the valley, I'd go and pick them up. Cool. And so every day, I'd see forty, eighty, two hundred girls in bikinis soaking <laughs> wet, coming out of the water. <laughs> Did you have a nice ride? Yeah, it was wonderful. And, uh, and I, I realized, yeah, you know, I, one of the vows was celibacy. And uh, after a couple of months of that. Uh, living a celibate life by, but being fully in the world, sure. I realized this is not what I want. If, if I can't have the 100% of monastic life, sure. then I'd rather be in the world. Sure. That's just, I'm, I'm a all or nothing kind of guy. And so I gradually grew out of the monastic situation. Um, and there was nothing, nothing stressed or forced about it. It wasn't, wasn't anything negative. It was just a change in circumstances. In the years before that, I'd become a tailor. Uh, in the monastery, they, they trained me to, to make okay. at, uh, suits. So the most logical thing to do when I left was to start a little company and start to sell my suits. Sure. And that was a very exciting uh, phase in my life. It was, it was very difficult because I knew nothing about marketing. And I was actually very against it because I had this you know, whole, I'm a fresh ex-monk and I'm an ethical person and I don't do marketing. Oh, sure, I sure. just need a blog and word of mouth, which was not enough. Sure. Uh, so the first few months was a bit difficult, but I got by and I started getting some, some call. Then my father died and he left me money. Uh, it was about a year after the monastery. And I thought that's... Sad, but at least my company is going to survive because once you have money, you can invest. I'm, I'm, I'm unbreakable now. Right. But I still didn't do any marketing and I didn't make any plan for how to spend my money. Um, and it was sizable. It was about $150,000 uh, altogether that I tried to invest. But because I had no plan at all, I put my money in the wrong kind of... I went and did a European hotel tour trying to find clients there. So for every country it was between hotels and dinners and, and flights like a thousand two thousand dollars oh for sure yeah goes very fast <laughs> yeah. you, and, you know, 150k lasts really doesn't last very long so yeah three or four years after um, that money was gone yeah. and I had to reinvent myself uh, and decide whether I'm going to actually live in Barcelona where there is more clientele because where I moved in Spain by that time and tried to run my, my business uh, is a very small town on the coast. It's, it's farmers and fishermen here and they don't spend two thousand dollars on a suit. Sure. Probably. Right. So that's the I last thing they would spend the money on, right? Well yeah. They they, they, they spend it on a car. <laughs> right. Um, and I didn't want to live in a city. That was just very clear. I, I'd spent so many time, um, uh, years uh, living in the fields in Belgium in the monastery, I, I wanted something very small and rural. And that means no clients. So I started writing articles and selling them to just pay the bills. And I really enjoyed that. And people liked my work. And at some point, about a year after, I decided to make that my full-time living and to put the tailoring company to sleep. Which was basically a failure, you know, to realize that I'd forfeited my entire inheritance and had gone bankrupt and had failed at running a shop. Sure. But the funny thing is that in those final weeks when, when the decision was coming and I was feeling the pressure and I was months behind in rent and I didn't know what to do with myself, I remember waking up one day and I just laid in bed for three hours staring at the ceiling feeling happy, so completely blissful. And it's only in, in, in this year that I realized that, yeah, but um, something in me was aware at that point that something new was going to come of it. This ruin in which I'm living now, this, this entire mess, big failure, is going to be the foundation of something new and better. I had no idea myself. I just was you know, laying there wondering, what, how can I possibly feel this good? Right. But another part of me uh, was aware that failure is what you build your successes on. And that's something that actually some, some very smart people um, uh, said on, on podcasts that I've been listening to this year. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Covey, what is it? Dave Covey, Stephen Covey? Oh, Stephen Covey, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think he had uh, a whole TED talk about it. Um, about I'm failure. Not sure, not sure if he's the one, but the, um, a couple of people have been talking about it. In fact, um, Michael Stelsner of Social Media Examiner, his latest podcast uh, just out a few days ago, is about failure and, and how that uh, builds you up. Right. Yeah, I'm a big believer in uh, the, uh, there's uh, J- uh, John C. Maxwell. He's a big personal development author and he mm-hmm. so- talks about failing forward. Um, you know, mm-hmm. every failure is just another step towards reaching your, your success. And oh, you know, he gave examples of people that have done uh, marvelous things in the world that um, fell on their face, but they just kept on going and they learned from it and they got better and better. And, and sure enough, they, they ended up uh, where they are today, you know, and, yeah. and there is something to say, you know, a lot of people are scared of fe- failure. Um, it, it, it's, it, it does, it's, it sucks, you know, failing is, is not something that we all strive for. You know, you don't start a business because you want it to fail. You want it to be great. You know, you started the tailor shop because you wanted it to be awesome and, and mm-hmm. pay the bills and, and you're giving back and, you know, making people look and feel good. Uh, but mm-hmm. obviously that, that didn't pan out, but it is part of your journey. If that didn't happen, if you didn't invest your, your dad's inheritance uh, in trying to keep that afloat, um, you know, what What would happen? Would you still be trying to limp that business along or would you put it to sleep uh, when you did? I don't know, you know, and, and know. now obviously you're in a much, much better place with helping individuals with marketing and copywriting and things that you truly enjoy and love and you're passionate about, you know, so. Well, that's the thing that it, it's, it's very funny that uh, even before the monastery, I, I was against uh, uh, marketing. And that whole phase, these 12 years, uh, running the tailoring company and still having that dumb mindset, basically. At some point, I realized I, I can't continue like this and I'll have to. And I started with Copy Blogger and reading James Chartrand sure. uh, of Men With Pens. And because they had this social, uh, ethical kind of like, no, you, you, you're in business because you solve problems for people. And I thought, oh, well, then marketing isn't actually such a bad thing because that makes it actually an ethical act to put yourself sure, out there. Sure, right. Because somebody who needs a solution is looking for that solution to whatever problem it is. And if you learn how to present that solution that you have in a pleasant and non-pushy, non-spammy way, then you're doing people a favor. Right. Not just yourself. You're also bringing solutions to people. Hey, ho, I should learn marketing. Right. Right. And so then I spent a couple of years as a copywriter really um, uh, focusing on uh, writing sales copy, sales pages and opt-in pages and ads and video sales script and, and all that kind of thing. Until I realized this year that what I should really be doing is showing people that transformation that I had, that actually it's fun to get in front of people and say, hey, this is what it does, this is what it costs. It might not be right for you. It might, if it is. This is the, the, the price. Here's where you sign. Um, and that experience to, to switch from uh, creating sales copy into teaching, yeah, that, that was a golden find. Uh, oh. I couldn't have been happier with, with that switch. Cool, cool. They do say mm-hmm. the most uh, thrilling people, the people that find the most joy are people that teach. You know, uh, they, they share their knowledge. Um, you know, with others. And, and obviously that's what you're doing. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving us, to be honest, I believe everybody is, is marketing themselves in some way. Uh, Everything is marketing. Yes. Yes. It, it really is. Uh, from the mom yes. that's driving their kids to soccer practice right now, or, or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the dad that's, uh, you know, doing his own uh, cleaning business, whatever it is, everybody's marketing. Um, and mm-hmm. what is, I guess, a couple of things that you think, or that you have spoken to other people that is a reoccurring theme when it comes to marketing that we're missing, that we're not doing a better job of. Is there anything that sticks out? Yeah. Being unaware how much you could actually help people if that thing that you make and that you're passionate about shows up more in front of people, right? Again, it's it's an, an ethical thing and you're you're missing your task as a human being, if you've got something great and you're not doing what's necessary to have people find it, there are people looking for you, for you, for me, for everybody who's got something that's truly valuable. Sure. It's worth its money. 
um, and and it, it goes from from uh, medicine to alternative medicine to ebooks to copywriting websites design art anything sure is something that another person would gladly pay you money for oh I'm so glad I found you yeah how are they going to find you if you make yourself findable right. which is another way of saying promoting and marketing your stuff and that is something that I come across with with a lot of people and once they they realize that um, uh, that is actually easy and it's fun to find people who would be very glad to 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 buy from you their world changes and I see that with with my students that, uh, yeah. um, the most unlikely person uh, will suddenly discover that they really enjoy selling their paintings I go, okay win score right right <laughs> Right. Because that's that's what I do it for. You know, the, um, selling has this this bum rap, as if it's it's inherently bad to sell something. And I always say, well, you know, imagine you're a baker, and somebody walks um, to your bakery and is looking around, and you, are you hungry? Then I've got uh, white bread and brown bread, and I've got raisin rolls. Cost this much. There's nothing unethical about it. This guy comes in with a problem. He's hungry. You've got a solution. <laughs> yeah. You get paid for that. Very so true. Very true. Why would anybody have um, any scruples about about promoting, marketing, or selling something? To sell is human. There's a quote by by Dan Pink, and it's true. We've been selling stuff uh, since since uh, the dawn of mankind, when you used to live in your cave uh, with your bear skin on. And I would be out hunting uh, uh, a deer. I'd come home through the rain with this deer slapping behind me. And I didn't have a fire. And I'd go up to you and I'd go, har, 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 which means, <laughs> do you want to have half of my catch? I'll let you have it if I can sit by your fire and roast my half. So I sold you some of my catch so that you would give me something in return. Yeah. It's, the, it's the fundament of, of human nature to exchange one thing for another. And if you're not selling something, uh, you're not making an effort for, uh, for for people to be able to find you. Yeah, and then you're not helping yourself, and you're not helping anybody else. No, that's very true. You know, uh, personally, I I started this project around two years ago, and mm -hmm. at first, I was very I was intimidated to market myself. You know, um, yep. I, I knew the, the things, the people I would bring on this podcast would help somebody. I mean. The, Okay, to be honest, there's maybe 100 people listening to this right now, this second. We'll just say that 80 of them are kind of checked out like, hey, you know what, Martin doesn't resonate with me. But those 20 people yeah. that are engaged and just drinking in this conversation, they're mm -hmm. going to take away and go, wow, that was awesome. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Wow, Martin, you know, he gave me some great ideas how to keep my attitude up and you know to find happiness. It's all around me. I just need to be aware of it, blah, 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 all that stuff. And they get it. And the tough part is, is to keep on knowing that these hundred people are listening, but only 20 of them are getting someone out, something out of it. But that's marketing. That's daily life. That's daily conversation. That's meeting somebody on the street randomly. You're not always going to find your best friend just walking past you. You, you got to talk to many, many different people to get, you know, to find your, your person. So um, the, the one thing that I think when it comes to marketing that people are holding back on, they're scared. They don't want to put themselves too far out there. They don't want to seem scammy. They don't want to seem in your face and like you need this and, and pay them the money. How do we get past that? Hmm. Well, you go to my website and you sign up for my mentorship <laughs> course. <laughs> yes. How do you get past that? Um, I think it starts with self-esteem. To to look at yourself in the mirror and say, "Yeah, I do something that's that's good, that's worth its money, and that I deserve getting paid for." I think that's that's something that uh, uh, holds a lot of people back to just to say, yeah, but I'm just a so and so, and then I've only just started this, or there are people much better than me. No, you're you're good as you are, even if there are people who have more experience who have uh, fancier products. Um, you, with what you do and the personality that you bring and the type of service or treatment that you give people. Um, are in that 20% for certain people. Right. And that sets you apart as the person that you are 
from that competition, even if that competition has a bigger audience. And to recognize that, yeah, you're, you're all right, you're valuable. What you do is worth it. I think that's where it starts, that, that, that you get to come to terms with simply the, the activities uh, and the strategies of getting your name out there. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And, and self-esteem is really huge because if somebody is not on the, in the online space currently and they work at a corporate job, and they're mm-hmm. looking for a job promotion, you know, having that self-esteem, mm-hmm. knowing, you know what, oh, yeah. I am the right person. You know what, I do have the credentials. I busted my hump here and there. You can see my work ethic, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I am capable, but instead we're shy, bashful. We don't want to bring attention to ourselves and stuff like that. But, you know, the people that get the promotions in those jobs and, and move up the chain in the offline world are the mm-hmm. ones that are hustling, are marketing themselves daily, that are putting themselves in front of the, the you know the crowd and leading from the front and and doing what is necessary to to show that they're the, mm-hmm. the right candidate for for the future positions or the current positions or whatever. Right. So, no, I, I think you, you pretty much hit it on the head, especially with the the, the self esteem, because everybody at some point lacks self esteem, but you got to do that self talk to kind of pick mm-hmm. yourself up and, and to say, you know what, why not me? You know, why not me to, to do A, B, C, and D? So, um, am I not good enough? Of course I'm good enough. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah, very good point too. Um, Martin, my man, um, I always end the podcast with a, a kind of wrap up question. And that question is what does a self reset mean to you? Gee, that's a good question. <laughs> Belly laughter, meditation. Um, there's all kinds of ways that 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 you can have. So when I go sailing, I, that's that's a way to to reset myself. In terms of what it means in in the experience, it's uh, a sense of perspective, where I am in the world in relation to the planet and to other people, um, um, seeing the scale of things. You know, I, I like to look at the stars and just realize that I may be insignificantly small, but I belong here. And that's, um, to me, that's a self-reset experience. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, it's it's funny because every single person has such a different meaning and a different way to look at a self reset, and yeah. uh, and, it, and and I appreciate that. I, I actually really enjoyed the uh, the belly laughter. I, I think that that's that's <laughs> more needed more. That's needed more. I think in everybody's oh, yeah. life, you know. So. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and obviously, thank you for the great information that you and I have been talking yeah, about well. here for 45 minutes. Um, how can people get in touch with you and, and to see what you're about and to see if they resonate with you? Well, to, to uh, see what I'm about and just have a bit of fun, hit me up uh, on Twitter at uh, Martin Steller, with double L. Um, I usually try to make people smile if I can. And I, uh, I'm always looking for people who are actually talking there. All this this link sharing um, is nice, but you know, live ones. Sure. If anybody is active on Twitter, uh, hit me up. Um, uh, and if you want to see what my work is about and um, the things I write, are my, my daily emails go on my blog, and they are very much about this kind of thing, about attitude, about mindset, how to treat yourself right and others, uh, how to take care of business. And you can sign up for those emails or read them on the blog at martinsteller.com. Um, and that's about it. Cool, cool. I will put all the links and uh, the resources and things we talked about in the show notes over there at operationselfreset.com. But uh, mm-hmm. Martin, my man, uh, truly thank you uh, for, for uh, joining me this morning. Thank uh, you. I, you have a lot of great knowledge. Uh, you're a very calm demeanor gentleman, and I uh, appreciate that. And, you know, you're very clear on the things that that enlighten you, that excite you, and keep you moving mm-hmm. forward. So uh, keep on marketing yourself, and I'm going to try to do a better job on my end. And um, yeah, we'll keep in touch, and I appreciate it. All right, thanks a lot.
Well, there you go. Thanks again to my man, Martin. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. And also, too, if you guys want to find out the resources, links, and all that fun jazz that we spoke about in today's episode, head on over to operationselfreset.com forward slash Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, Stellar, S-T-E-L-L-A-R. And uh, yeah, you can find everything about Martin. So with that being said, I don't usually ask questions directly to you, but because I am looking for some really solid input, I need your help. If you could answer this one question, if you have time, if you don't, that's fine. No big deal. Continue to listen to this stuff. Um, Hopefully you find value in it. But if you are interested in helping me out, I have one question for you. What is the one thing that I can help assist you with? What is the one thing I can help assist you with? Answer it however you may. I don't even want to give you guys examples because then I'm going to skew you in a certain way. So send me an email, jake at operationselfreset.com. And also, too, please sign up for the email list on operationselfreset.com. Um, a lot of cool things coming down the pipe um, information-wise. I've surrounded myself with some pretty amazing individuals that have really opened up my own personal playbook. And I'm excited to see where this goes. Um, I got a couple of speaking engagements lined up and and things are going well. And the reason why they are going well is because I personally started. I started. I moved in a direction. And if there's one thing like a first step in change and resetting and all that stuff that you could do right now today is take some piece of information, either from this podcast, from a book, a magazine, an article from a friend told you, your grandmother, whatever, and take action on it. Actually do it. Because we all read, listened, heard, been told information that was like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. That's a good idea. And we do nothing with it. So the one thing that I want to challenge you directly is to take action on something. Something that was told about today, something you read, whatever it is. Even if you think it's ridiculous and it doesn't make sense, give it a try. Move in a direction. Stop standing still. Stop being in neutral. Put it in drive. Put it in reverse. Do something. And I guarantee great change, a great new life could possibly come to you just by doing something a little bit different. By taking A-C-T-I-O-N action. And that's it. That's all I got for you guys. So I appreciate the love. I appreciate the support. If you guys got any additional questions for me, my email is open 24 hours a day. It's like 7-Eleven, man. We never close. Email me, jake at operationselfreset.com. Love you all. Take care. We'll catch you next week, Wednesday, for another great episode.